Good morning, everyone. Great to see you on this beautiful sunny day. And, uh, you know, you get props in Alaska in late summer to come to church when the sun is shining, okay? Now, that means something here. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. There's nowhere I'd rather be when the sun is shining. And I know that's true for so many of you. Well, and I want to welcome also those of you who are joining us online. Um, I'm going to go straight to the point here today in terms of this message. We're in this series called Three because um, the message today is, man, I just wrestled through this um, because it's a little uncomfortable. Today, we're going to talk about the three groups in hell. And many pastors never talk about hell, right? Because after all, it can make people uncomfortable, right? Or it's not sensitive. But I disagree that it's not sensitive. I, I think if I really love you, if I really care about you, then I need to teach everything that God has. And Jesus actually talked about hell more than any other person talked about hell in the Bible. And Jesus actually talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. And why did Jesus talk about hell? Well, because what you and I believe about our eternity impacts the way that we live today. What we believe to be true for eternity, that matters. Even when America was still largely secular, not nearly as secular as it is today, but if we go back 150 years in America, um, even though the secular portion, the unsaved portion of America uh, was significant, and yet almost all of those unsaved people believed that the Bible was the Word of God, and they believed in hell. And it's one of the reasons why you would never, in a million years, you'd have never been able to convince that culture to support abortion. You would never have been able to conv convince that culture to celebrate depravity. Because they believed in hell. And so I think it's important for us to take a look because one of the primary reasons that people don't understand the magnitude or the magnificence of the good news of the gospel is because they don't understand, they don't see themselves as sinners who stand guilty before God and therefore deserving of hell. And to much of America, because the bad news isn't all that bad, then the good news isn't really all that good. After all, what does it matter? So you, you choose this religion, I choose that. What does it matter? Because if, if the bad news isn't really all that bad, then the good news isn't really uh, worth getting that excited about. It's one of the problems. It's one of the problems that we see, you, you know, across the board. You know, a lot of times we lay these things on teenagers because they're just the next generation. But the reality is, it's a problem whether you're, whether, whether you're 17 or whether, or, or whether you're 97. The problem in America is, is that people are like just so laissez-faire, so uh, uh, just non-committal and casual about the reality of Scripture and about faith. And so what we end up having is we end up having generations who rise up and grow up in this nation oftentimes still hearing again and again and again the gospel but never being saved. It just doesn't matter. It just, it's not that good a news. What Satan has to offer just seems to be better. Well, Jesus was a very, very straight talker. He was very black and white. In this world, you're on one team or you're on the other. There's no gray area, no fence sitting, no neutral zone. There's no choosing not to, make a, uh, to take a stand because choosing to not take a stand for Jesus is the same as standing against him. See, he, he didn't sugarcoat the truth. because what, Why? Because he loves us, right? And hell is life's greatest danger. Jesus said, don't fear the one who can kill your body and after that can do no more. Don't fear that one. He says, fear the one who after the body dies can throw the whole body and soul into hell. So 
this is, this is life's greatest danger. We, we need to talk about it. Jesus didn't just refer to hell. He described it in great detail. In Luke 16, 23, it says it's a place of eternal torment. In Mark 9, 45, he said it's a place of unquenchable fire where the worms that feed off bodies never die. In Matthew 13, 42, he describes it as a blazing furnace where people will weep and gnash their teeth. In Matthew 25, 30, it's a place of outer darkness. In Matthew 10, 28, he compared it to the rubbish heap outside the walls of Jerusalem where they took like all the sacrificial system, all the gut piles, everything, and all the trash from the city was burned and the fire never went out and he compared it to that place. Okay, why was hell created by God? It, it, it might surprise you to know that it wasn't created for people. People, people will go there by their own choosing. That's a tragic certainty. But hell was created for the devil and his fallen angels, what we call demons. When Jesus returns, he told us that every person ever born is going to be, uh, is going to be raised from the dead and, and our bodies will be rejoined with our spirit and we will stand before Christ for judgment. And he said he's going to separate people at that point into two groups. And then in Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said, then he will say, this is a day in the future of every person, beginning with Adam and Eve and every person forward. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. See, hell is the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's according to Jesus. It wasn't prepared for you and me. But listen, you're, you're going to follow then who you follow now. If you follow Christ, you follow him to heaven. If you follow Satan, you follow him to hell. That is every bit as clear in Scripture as any truth that God has given us. There's no denying Jesus knew, believed, warned against that, the absolute reality of hell. Well, why, if God is a loving God, why did he create it to begin with? See, God will not allow any being to partially follow him. He won't allow any, any created being to partially reject him. It, it, God is, is all or nothing. And God is good. So think about for a moment, the absence of God is the absence of good. The, if God's not there, there is no good thing. You're, the temperature's not going to be right. There will be no pleasing thoughts. There will be no, no, you, you know, nothing that brings you pleasure. There will be no good thing. The absence of God, that's the absence of good. If you reject God, you reject good. In hell, there will be no good thing. But God is also life. And the absence of God is the absence of life. This is why hell is referred to as the second death or a, and as eternal death because God is life and the absence of God is the absence of life. It's not going to be there. Now, God is just. He's perfectly fair to all people in all circumstances, okay? And, and those who reject him, and I'm talking about at, at when you stand before the Lord, and those who reject him, they are literally rejecting life. They are rejecting this wonderful gift of God's mercy and grace and instead choosing a way that seems right, but it leads to death. That's what Proverbs 14, 12 says. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And the problem with that way isn't that it seems wrong. The problem is it seems right. Make as much money as you can. Have as much fun as you can. Have as many highs as you can. Go as many places as you can. And then you die. It just, it seems right. God says, listen, it just leads to death. It's why, it's why the justice of God demands that he give us a free will to accept him, to reject him, to, to choose the way that we're going to follow. But he says to me, listen, I, I'm going to show you a good way. I'm going to show you the best way. I'm going to show you the only way that matters, the only way that's going to get you where you want in your heart of hearts, the, in, in, in your created inmost being, the place you want to go. I'll show you how to get there. And, and the problem is, there's another way that seems right. And Satan offers everything up front. All the rewards up front, the cost comes down the road. Okay? All the rewards come up front. Then you pay. Sin always, always takes you farther than you wanted to go. Costs you more than you wanted to pay. 
and keeps you longer than you wanted to stay. Satan knows that, right? That way seems right. So hell is a place of suffering because God is not there. So good is not there. And life is not there. All right? So that, that's a place of suffering. How do we know God is not there? 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. They will be shut out from the presence of the Lord. So who are the three groups who will spend eternity in hell? First, we have the devil and his demons. You know, Satan began his life in heaven with God. Some people don't know that. He, he rebelled. He was, uh, according to the scripture, he was this beautiful, angelic being. And he desired to put himself above God. He desired to be worshipped instead of God. And so he was cast out of heaven. And he was so uh, charismatic or beautiful or influential, whatever it was, that a third of the angels in heaven chose to go with him. We call those angels demon now. Uh, in, in Revelation 12, 9, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And of course, Jesus was right there, okay? In eternity past when this, when this happened, right? Jesus was there. In Luke 10, 18, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And, and for a season, and we don't understand all of this, but for a season, Satan has been given free reign upon the earth. I believe it's, it, it has to do, again, with him being an accuser and standing before God and saying, if you give them a chance, they'll follow me. They won't follow you. And I believe it's that, that, that as the accuser, right, who, who is wrestling for the eternal souls of men and women and children, that, that God has given him reign for a time because in his justice, God says to you and to me, you have to choose. I'm going to offer life. I'm going to offer love. I'm going to offer abundance. But you have to trust me. You have to believe me. You have to choose. So for a season, he's given this reign on the earth. He's, he's the ultimate liar, right? The father of lies. He's come, the Bible says, to steal and to kill and to destroy. The difference between the devil and his demons and, and the lost humanity is that the devil and his demons, their fate, has, their fate has already been sealed. But not so with people who are lost. All right? And so uh, Jude 6 says, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Matthew 25, 41, again, the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation 20, 10, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. See, the, de the devil is not the ruler of hell. He's just one more pitiful, rebellious, created being who's going to suffer there for eternity. Hell is not a sin party. Hell is a place of never-ending pain and torment and regret. It couldn't be anything else because God is not there. So we have these three groups in hell, the first being the devil and his demons. The second is those who reject Christ. Now, I was once a part of this group, and, and we can split this group into two, into halves. Um, first, the open revilers of Christ, the people who just openly reject him. Now, much of the world is openly hostile to Christians because they're openly hostile to Christ, right? They do not like that Jesus made exclusive truth claims. They don't like that he said, this is right and this is wrong. They do not like that he said, I am the way and no one comes to the Father except through me. They don't like that. And so they, they openly reject him. This includes the overwhelming majority of our college professors and upper level school teachers, a great number of politicians, local, two national levels, almost the entirety of our national media, including those who control social media, atheists, followers of false religions, including multitudes who grew up hearing about Christ and then chose to follow uh, something else. 
but it also includes millions of hardworking Americans who love their and take care of their families, but who don't believe in God and don't care enough to investigate whether he exists. They just say, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe any of that. You know, it also includes people who openly reject Christ. There's a small group of people in that group who reject him because they feel unworthy to be saved. They're, they're so caught up in guilt or shame because of things that they've done or experienced in life that they don't feel that they're worthy to be a child of God. And so they also hold God at arm's length and just openly reject him. I talked to a man this morning who said that was the case with him. He just, he, he, when he heard the gospel, he thought, well, it's not going to do me any good because I'm so, I'm so bad, I'm so terrible that, that if God doesn't choose to save me like, like, like a couple minutes before I die, I, there's no hope for me. He didn't feel worthy of the gospel, but the gospel broke through that, right? Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. You know, this group who reject Christ, it also includes some religious people. It, it includes a nation of people for whom we have great love and give great honor. It, it includes the Jews, much of the nation of Israel, who continue to this day to reject Christ. And so, some of the strongest words Jesus ever spoke, you know, um, I, I've seen before, I've never seen it in person, maybe some of you have, but I've seen like Hollywood making fun of Christians where pastors get up and preach on hell and it's like, it's like they're angry at the world and banging their fists and spits flying everywhere and, and, and they're just, you know, they're so mad that you think, you know, what's keeping that guy from hell, you know? Um, I've never actually seen somebody preach that way, but Jesus never gave one of those hellfire and brimstone uh, sermons to a crowd of people. The only time he spoke strongly like that was when he was speaking to religious leaders who opposed him, to people who were supposed to be leading the children he loved and were leading them wrongly. This is what he said to some religious leaders who opposed him in Matthew 23, 15. He said, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you win one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. In Matthew 23, 33, to the same group, he said, you snakes, you brood of vipers, literally, you nest of poisonous snakes, how will you escape being condemned to hell? See, there's no such thing as truly worshiping the God of heaven apart from Jesus Christ. Okay, it's not the same worship to the same God. Because Jesus said this to his disciples in Luke 10, 16. He said, whoever listens to you, talking to his disciples, listens to me. Okay? Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, Jesus said, rejects him who sent me. Rejecting the Son is rejecting the Father. So we have the three groups in hell, the devil and his demons and those who reject Christ, and that's split in half. People who openly revile Christ, reject him. And then the, the other group of those who reject him are, are, are those who ignore Christ. There are many people in the world who would be quick to tell you they haven't rejected Christ. In fact, they would be deeply offended if you suggested that they had. They've never made a decision to reject him. All right? Uh, they, they, they simply haven't. It, and, and I'll tell you, it, statistically in America, this includes the overwhelming majority of our teenagers and college students, the overwhelming, a strong percentage also of the people living around us who have not rejected Christ. And they think, some of them, that someday when they have time or when they're done with the party life that they love or when they have children and settle down, someday they'll investigate religion in Jesus. But for now... They're just not motivated. They just aren't that interested. They have more important things going on, they, they think. So they just ignore Christ. But Hebrews 2, 3 says, how shall we escape? Talking about escaping hell. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? You don't have to openly reject Jesus to go to hell. Ignoring him is every bit as dangerous, every bit as foolish, every bit as irresponsible as rejecting him. And, and the reason is because we already stand condemned. Our own sin condemns us. If God tells the truth and I stand before him this morning and the accuser, Satan, stands there and says to God, he belongs to me. 
because he's lied. And if, if God said, well, have you ever lied? Yes, Lord. Well, if God tells the truth, guilty. Have you ever looked lustfully at a woman? Yes, Lord, guilty. Have you ever taken anything that doesn't belong to you? Yes, Lord, guilty. Have you ever dishonored your parents? Yes, Lord, guilty. I'm only up to four. I can go further. If God tells the truth, I've not given him any choice. Guilty, 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 guilty. And it is only because as I stand there with my guilt before him that I have Jesus stepping between us. That God is able to say to me, the price has been paid. This one belongs to me. Those who ignore, believe that they can escape, but you have to remember we stand already guilty. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That's talking about the second death. It's talking about eternal death. It's talking about being separate. Why? God is holy. He's pure. He's perfect. Sin is like poison. How much poison can you put in that cup of pure water and then drink it? None. It's not pure anymore. And, and, and the impure and the pure, they don't mix. It's like oil and water. And so we're separated from God because we're impure, because of our sin. There's no middle road. You can't ignore Christ and be safe because you haven't yet made a decision. Ignoring him is a decision. Matthew 12, 30, Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus was always talking in the terms of a shepherd and sheep, and, and a shepherd's role is to gather sheep. In fact, he told a parable where one out of a hundred was missing, and he went and found it to gather it. And he said, listen, if you're not gathering with me, if you're not gathering people, the people around you, if you're not gathering the people you work with, if you're not gathering the people in your class, if you're not gathering, you're scattering. You're driving them away from me. There's not a middle here. If you're not gathering, if you're not with me, you're against me. If you're not gathering, you're scattering. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, but those who reject Christ, either openly or simply by ignoring his salvation, will also be there. And this is a primary ministry of the church. Like I told you, I used to be in that group. This is not a group for us to write off. This is the mission. This is the ministry of the church. Right? And we are to go, therefore, we're to take. It's good news. You know, I lived that way. I could care less. Some of the things, sometimes I have to remind Satan that what he's rem reminding me of, things that I've done, I have to remind him that God has forgotten that, and I'm not going to bring it up. Right? That's right. And that's, that's important for us to remember. Right? When we talk about the, the, these people who reject him, this, this does not make a person the enemy of, of Christians. This, this makes a person the target of the love of Jesus. Right? He came to save sinners. This is why he came. And so we have those first two groups in hell, the devil and his demons, and those who reject Christ openly or by, just by ignoring him. And then the third group that we have in hell are Christian church members who are not saved. Guys, this is a very large group in the world today. These are all people who claim to be Christians and they're not saved. That shouldn't surprise us because according to a recent survey, only slightly over half of those who claim to be Christian even believe in hell. Only just, just a little over half even believe in hell. Fewer than half of those who claim to be Christian believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Uh, according to a 2020 study by George Barna, he does all of the, he's the major religious researcher organization in the world. And according to a study just last year, only 6% of American adults, that's age 18 and older, only 6% have a biblical worldview. Six in 100 see the world the way that God says that it really is. That means that many of America's churches are filled with people who do not believe that the Bible is true. They don't see the world according to God's revealed truth. In other words, they hold beliefs and opinions that are contrary to the Word of God. But they claim to be Christian. 
and they honestly believe they're Christians. I was like that. And Jesus talked about what it will be like for those people on the day of judgment in Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, I have to be clear about this because one group of people bears more responsibility for the tragedy of an unbelieving church than any other for wrong thinking that has infected the church, and that's pastors. James 3.1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Matthew 18, 6, Jesus said, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. My great-grandmother had a millstone in front of her house. It was probably about this big around and about this tall off from the ground. And Jesus said, it'd be better to have that hung around your neck and be thrown into the sea than to lead someone astray when it comes to Jesus. I've been in many churches, many where the pastors are not saved. I once had a pastor begin a message. He said, God the Father or God the Mother, depending on what school you went to. And I whispered to my wife, I was so pierced in my spirit, this is before I was in ministry, and I said, it's funny God doesn't strike him dead. I've been in doing weddings and funerals in churches where the pastors are not saved. I had a priv the privilege a few years ago of preaching in a church that not only doesn't preach the gospel, but preaches against it. This is very common. And, and this, uh, I've, I've shared this before, but one thing you need to understand is if you've had the rich blessing of growing up from the time you got saved, no matter if that was childhood or adult, but if you had the privilege of growing up in a church that opens the Bible and faithfully teaches the Word of God, then it's easy for you to assume that every building with a cross on it is just another flavor of us. And I'm telling you, it isn't true. It isn't true. There are whole denominations now in the United States that, that at one time in their history were a part of the bride of Christ in the church, but today are, are completely gone and lost. They do not, not only don't preach the truth, but they preach what is contrary to truth. And I was in that church like that, and I was invited to preach. And the church was filled with people just like me, because I grew up in a church like that. And it, it was filled with people who had been attending church trying to do the right thing. Many of them, I'm sure, for their whole lives, but they'd never heard the gospel. And as I shared the gospel with them, I mean, I could just see them. They were just leaning forward. I mean, literally everyone leaning forward. They were drinking it in. It was like pouring water on a dry sponge. And they were just taking this in because they were trying to do the right thing. They were in a church on a Sunday morning. It had a cross on it. And finally, somebody was explaining to them how to be saved. And they were drinking it in. All but one person. The pastor who got up after I was done and preached against what I had just shared. Whole, whole groups of former Christian churches are now in spiritual darkness. They're like social clubs uh, and they're dying a slow death because today's young people have no tolerance for dead religion. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing to have no tolerance for dead religion. Some of you know, you grew up in churches like that, all right, where, where you, you, you get through it, you go out to the car, you slam the car door, and everybody goes, oh, you know, we endured that for another week, right? Let's go eat, right? You, you go reward yourself with lunch, and then you try and get up your nerve the next Sunday morning because, oh, we got to, you know, we got to get through this, through this again. Okay, that's a travesty. That's a shame. That's a mockery, Right? Thank you, Jesus, that young people don't, have, don't want to tolerate that today. If we could get America's pastors saved, I believe that we would see millions of people swept into the kingdom of God. I believe that. But let's bring this closer to home. Because 
True Bible teaching churches also have members who are not saved. There are some people who acknowledge the truth of the Word of God. They acknowledge the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They acknowledge the need to repent and to be forgiven. At one time or another, they probably prayed a prayer of salvation, but they've never been born again. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Now, some of you have a Bible that says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. And I want you to take your pen and just draw a line through that because it is a wrong translation coming straight from the pit of hell, okay? Because Satan loves to get in and change the word of God if he can. You can go back to the Greek and you can look it up. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, which is a very different thing than if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, whatever that means, Right? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Now, why would I say that there are people who have prayed and believe all those things, but they've never been born again? Because the Scripture says the old is gone and the new has come. So the old me, who had the filthiest mouth in an infantry company, was gone. And the new came, and the old me that was always looking for a fight was gone, and there was a new me, and the old me who, who had a temper that would go from zero to a hundred in less than a second, that was gone. Because the old is gone and the new has come. And there are so many people who believe and acknowledge the truth of the Scriptures, the need to repent, and they've said a prayer, but if you look at their life, it's just the same old person with a little Jesus painted on. There's an old and a new. Every person who's been born of God has the Spirit of God living inside him or her. Every person born of God has a life, lives a life centered upon and resting upon faith in Jesus Christ. Every person who's been born of God is growing to be more like Christ from day to day and year to year. It should be true for every person following Jesus that, that as compared with five years ago, you are more patient, you're more kind, you're more tender, you're more gentle, you're more generous, you're more loving. It should be true because those are fruits of the Spirit and you don't have to work to get better in any of those. All you have to do is walk with Jesus. If I just stay connected to Jesus, the fruit grows. Okay, you, you never see an apple tree out in an orchard going, ah! trying to grow an apple, right? <laughs> Fruit just, if, it just, if the branch is connected to the trunk, the apple's going to grow, all right? And, and, and that's what the fruit of the Spirit. It's just going to happen if you're connected. Galatians 2.20 is written as a past tense statement for every follower of Jesus Christ. This is a past tense truth statement for your life and for mine if you belong to Jesus. I have been crucified with Christ. And now I, the me that was before, no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Every true believer has a new heart, a new mind, a new love for God and others. Every true believer loves the church, loves the word of, word of God, loves to worship and praise. Every true believer is thankful and is growing in all of those fruits of the Spirit, and the world can see it. The world can see it. Well, Pastor Brad, isn't it possible for somebody to be walking with Jesus for a while and then, you know backslide. Yes, of course, a person can choose to sin. But the whole time that you're choosing to sin, you're going to be under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to have rest. You're not going to have peace, not in your conscience, not in your heart, not physically or physiologically, because you're under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, because you have put a barrier between your heart and the heart of God, and you just can't live that way. And sooner or later, the Holy Spirit, because he loves you, is going to wear you out. And you're going to come back to Jesus. Say, help me, help me, help me, Lord, right? I want to conclude with good news and then bad news and then good news again. So I'm going to tell you up front, okay? So good news is coming, all right? 
God is a keeper of books. And the most important one is called the book of life. And every person whose name is found in it will spend an eternity in heaven. A place where the colors are brighter and, and the tastes are, are, are sharper and everything is more magnificent. The scripture describes the world we live in as a, as a dim reflection in a mirror. Like we're living in the shadow lands now and suddenly the, the life as it is, it's just going to explode around us. That's the heaven and it's promised and it's waiting for every person whose name is in the book of life. That's the good news. The bad news Revelation 20, 15, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Because you follow then who you follow now. And if you choose to spend your life chasing after those things that have no value, those things that Satan entices you with, if you choose to spend your life that way, in the moment that your heart stops beating, it will be too late for you. It's hell, it's certain, it's true, but it's not too late as long as you're breathing, as long as you're living. So good news again. John 5, 24, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but is crossed over from death to life. A crossing, this is the verse where we get our name as a church, the crossing, we're a place where people cross over from death to life. Whoever hears my word and believes, this, this is it. If you're not certain that you're a child of God, you can settle that here, now. The most important truth on earth comes straight from the mouth of Jesus Christ. John 3, 16. Jesus said, speaking of himself, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He continued by saying, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Like I said, I, if I stood before God apart from Jesus, I've given him no choice. Guilty, guilty, guilty. but with Jesus Christ. Because I no longer, that person, that guilty person, that, that person is dead and gone. A and I've been crucified with Christ and now Christ lives in me. And so I stand before the Father and all he sees is Jesus. Right? Does that mean I'm perfect like him? No. It means I'm covered by the blood of Jesus Christ that I've received the mercy of God and the grace of God. And that's what he offers. That's why it's good news. It's good news. If you've never prayed and asked him to forgive you and save you, or if you recognize that you don't have an after story. Some of you, you know your before story. You were a little kid. Well, let me tell you something. The sin of a five-year-old who's being selfish or rebellious is every bit, every bit is, is, uh, as uh, significant and serious in the eyes of God. Okay, as, as, as the sin of that adult. Yeah, you have a before and after story, but you may just measure it by your after. And you know your after story is on target because Jesus is at the center. Jesus is at the center. The Holy Spirit is in you, praise God. But if you don't have that, then maybe this is your day and you need to come to him and say, Lord Jesus, I just recognize I'm just the same old me. And I do believe I do believe that you're the Messiah and I confess to you and I surrender my life. Boy, you do that and the promise of God is he will meet you there. That he will forgive you and save you and adopt you to be a child of God. We'll all bow and pray with you. If that's your heart, just pray this simple prayer of faith. Pray with me right now. Jesus, I do believe you're the son of God. I believe that you were crucified that you died, that you were buried, and that you rose again. I confess to you that I'm a sinner. You know everything that I've said and done and thought. I know that I'm guilty. 
And I see in your word that the wages of sin is death, the second death, eternal death. And I know that apart from you, there is no good thing. Apart from you, there's no life. And so I'm coming to you, Jesus, by faith, asking you to please forgive me and save me. I'm asking you to adopt me to be a child of God. Here and now, I surrender my old life to you. Come into my heart and life. Make me new. I thank you, Jesus, for loving me. And by faith, I'm receiving the gift of forgiveness and new life. Thank you for saving me. Show me now how to live in a way that pleases you.